Okay, so uh, welcome back everyone, this uh, time with uh, Florian Forster giving us introduction to uh, Collect D. So, enjoy. So, good morning everybody. I hope this uh, thing is on. Um, I'm going to give you an introduction about Collect D, as mentioned. First, I was hoping first. Uh, Two, two words about me. My name is Florian Forster, but most people know me by my IRC nickname for many years uh, as Octo. Um, I've been doing open source work for a while, and I started the Collect D project in 2005, and I'm still a uh, project maintainer to this day. Let's see. Yay, Technic. Um, so this is what I'm going to cover today. First, I'm giving you a brief introduction to Collect D. Um, Afterwards, uh, I, I go, I'm going to explain to you how to aggregate metrics and why you might want to do this. And last but not least, uh, I'll show how you can do, how, how you can use Colleague D to, to do alerting with Nsinga. So, let's dive into Colleague D. Colleague D is a Unix daemon which runs in the background. Uh, it is collecting, metri collecting metrics, it can transport metrics, uh, mangle in a bit, and uh, it can uh, store metrics. Uh, so if you remember Chris's uh, keynote from yesterday, monitoring sex to monitoring love, this would be like the first three points off of his six or seven point list. Um, Collect D is an open source project. The uh, vast majority to this day is uh, licensed under the MIT license. It used to be mostly GPL licensed, and we're in the process of trying to relicense everything under MIT. Uh, but we have close to 200 contributors, so this is a longer process that's uh, taking place. And we're not going to be finished anytime soon, I'm afraid. It is platform independent, so it runs on any operating system that has an X in its name, and also free BSD or BSDs and Solaris. Um, it does not run on Windows. There's a commercial product called SSC Surf that can do basically the same thing that Colleague D can do, uh, but it's uh, not open sourced. The design of Colleague D is an agent based design, so Colleague D is running on every node that you want to monitor, more or less. Um, you can have a Colleague D server to, to receive all the metrics and then do some central stuff if. if you want to do this. This is, of course, interesting if you want to do alerting with Nsinga on, on top of this. But it doesn't have to be. And it is easily extensible, uh, in my opinion, anyways. Uh, we have language bindings for Perl, Python, and Java. The daemon itself is written in C. The vast majority of the plugins that it ships with is written in C. Uh, I know that many people are not that happy about writing C code, so these are your options. We have, like Mod Perl or Mod Python in Apache, these are embedded interpreters, so th there's no fork, forking of any scripts going on. Uh, likewise with Java and JNI. Uh, you can fork scripts and thereby basically use whatever floats your boat, Ruby or whatever, um, via the exec plugin, which works similar to the way that Nagios checks are performed, as in we have a script, it's forked, uh, there is a difference uh, because we usually have very high frequency for these metrics. Uh, we don't necessarily fork for every single data collection, but you can have the script running and basically do its own uh, sleep uh, collection cycle and output multiple metrics after uh, one after the other. Um, Colleague D is it's a, uh, a plugin-based design, it's very modular, so the, the core daemon is a little more than a scheduler and, uh, and a, a cache of the previous collected metrics. And if you actually want to get any data into the system, you have to use so-called read plugins or input plugins. Um, they roughly fall into three categories. There's a lot of system metrics in there, like CPU, disk, memory, uh, in from very basic stuff like the one listed here to very obscure NUMA balancing things that you can request or 
I don't know, slab tables and so on and so forth. So you can dive really deep if, you, if you're really into this kind of stuff. We have a lot of application metrics. Uh, MySQL would be an example, but if you're more like a Redis guy or you're interested in your memcache performance, you can do this as well. Uh, you can also query values stored in memcache and base your monitoring on, on top of this. So there's a wide variety. And then there's other stuff, which in my opinion is often the most interesting and fascinating for the geeky, nerdy types. Uh, as an example, uh, Xeon Phi is one of these high performance computing uh, platforms that Intel offers. Uh, it, it looks like a PCI card that you put into your computer, but it actually is like a cell CPU that runs its own Linux version and you can communicate with this via the PCI bus and it, I don't know, does like many, many gigaflops or teraflops. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. Didn't know it existed until a patch came along that implemented support. Uh, there's SNMP support. We can do one wire queries a little bit anyways. Uh, and crap ton of other stuff. So th there's a hundred plugins or so that, that provide any sort of metrics. I can't possibly name all of them, but uh, we have a very fairly complete wiki that lists, I would say, 98% of the plugins that we have. So uh, you should find what you're looking for, I hope. On the other side, so once you have collected the metrics, you usually want to get them out of there to somewhere. Not always, but usually that's the case. Today, I'm going to, to focus on graphite. Uh, a more traditional choice would have been uh, our D-tool, uh, possibly via the caching daemon. And uh, Riemann has been mentioned also in the uh, opening, uh, which can do a lot of uh, aggregation uh, to, to metrics, which can be very, very helpful. Um, so if what I'm going to show you afterwards with the aggregation that's possible inside Colleague D is not good enough for you, Riemann should have you covered, hopefully. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you can write to MongoDB. There's like a write HTTP plugin that essentially does post requests with JSON da data, and you can just consume that JSON data and do whatever you want with that. Uh, a lot of these fancy new monitoring startups use that way to get metrics into their systems. This is an example plugin of Colleague D just to show, give you an idea and a feel for how the, the uh, daemon is configured. We are aiming for a Apache-like uh, configuration language. Um, on the left, you see the, the input, like the data coming into the system. Of, as an example, we have three plugins that are loaded, the CPU and memory plugins, which do not require any additional uh, configuration, and the DF plugin, which uh, reads the amount of disk space available and used. Uh, not to be confused with the disk plugin, which actually uh, calculates uh, I.O. Uh, operations and, and traffic to and from the disks. And you don't need to configure the DF plugins, and I would argue about half the plugins don't need configuration, but oftentimes you want to have configuration. For instance, the DF plugin, the um, available space on the DEF file system or some uh, tempfs file systems don't really make all that much sense. Uh, so you can limit this to, for example, the root mount point here, uh, or if all your data is actually mounted somewhere else, and that's what you're into, uh, you can do this. You can select by file system type and, and so on and so forth. The options available, of course, depend on the plugin in use. Most plugins, I, ha I think, have a fairly complete configuration set for most use cases. If it doesn't cover you, it's open source, send a patch. Uh, but especially the, the basic plugins. We haven't had all that many feature requests in the past, so I think that they are good enough for the vast majority of people. On the right, uh, the, the output side, in this example, uh, Graphite. There's a right Graphite plugin, which is implemented in C and comes with Colleague D. There, before this plugin was implemented, there were a couple of third-party plugins that were never submitted upstream. 
that still happily live in some GitHub repository somewhere, like the uh, colleague D. Carbon that was mentioned earlier, uh, yesterday, actually. Um, don't use that. Use that one. That's state of the art. So this plugin uh, talks directly to Graphite. Essentially, it opens a, a socket, and it connects, and it can talk the Graphite wire protocol. Um, Quick side note, you can use the, the case that every client that you monitor, every server or yeah, every server where you have the agent running connects directly to your Graphite instance and basically pushes data in. Or you can first get all the data onto one colleague D server and then have like one big pipeline to your Graphite setup. Um, I, I did a quick poll on IRC before uh, this conference and it appears that people use both. So it's both options are in, in widespread use. I have to admit to my shame that I don't know enough about Graphite to, to basically tell you all of the ups and downs of both approaches. But it, it's both possible. Uh, if you want to know more about Graphite, and I'm not the perfect person to answer all of this, uh, there's a presentation on Graphite later today by uh, Falkstern. Uh, in this room at uh, 3.30. So that's everything I have on as an introduction to the daemon itself. Now would be a perfect time to ask questions to colleague D specifically. Gentleman in the back. Does the uh, write plugin store the data locally when it can send to the output? So the, the question is if, if there's caching of some sort, like a network outage, and the answer is no, there's not. Um, again, it depends, of course, on the write plugin. So it's an implementation detail of the write plugins, but to my knowledge, none of the write plugins actually do this. Uh, the best you can get with the current existing plugins is probably to use uh, AMQP as a message broker, and then the broker will, will cache your messages. Uh, doesn't really help you if you know the switch is down for the server or something. But um, yeah, that sorry, not currently. Hi, um, what's the uh, memory footprint of the collect D? Uh, depends on how much data you have, of course, uh, because we keep the last, uh, last valid metric in, in memory to, to look it up. In general, it is small, as in OpenWRT, the Linux distribution that runs on the hardware Linux routers that you can buy for 50 euros. Uh, they de install collect D if requested and provide uh, uh, metrics of, of interfaces and so on uh, via this way. So it, it's small enough to run in like eight megabytes of, of memory. Um, every once in a while somebody complains about the memory footprint being too high, which is due to uh, colleague D using a lot of threads. And threads, like the POSIX thread library by default uh, allocates like eight megabytes or so of stack. So if you have 10 threads, uh, it allocates like 80 megabytes. and it's not usually a problem because Linux does over-provisioning uh, of, of memory per default. Uh, some people sometimes are confused and think this is not the case. It is. So just because the, the process has like 100 megabyte of virtual memory addressable doesn't mean that it actually is using 100 megabyte. The actual memory footprint is small on the agents usually. On the server, of course, you have couple of thousand metrics per second coming in, uh, you want to do this and, and cache everything in memory with 100 megabytes. Not going to happen. But all in all, uh, I don't know, 100 megabytes should get you there. But uh, if, if you're like the very basic stuff and that's good enough for you, I don't know, half a megabyte maybe. Okay. Um, second question maybe as well. Um, to um, What kind of dependencies do you have? Uh, uh, good question, uh, and not an easy answer. Um, the, the daemon itself, 
does not have any dependencies other than Python. The plugins, of course, have all sorts of dependencies. Uh, I mentioned AMQP, which is, of course, linked against RabbitMQ. We are not implementing AMQP ourselves. It's like a, I don't know, 200-page specification. Um, the, the basic stuff usually uh, works without uh, dependencies, like the CPU plugin in, on Linux just goes to slash proc and reads its information on BSE, uses syscontrol. Uh, I know ARX has, it's a lot of uses case that ARX has something perf stat or some, some system call. Um, the the HTTP related stuff usually uses libcurl. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it, it's really, it really depends. Like the varnish uh, plugin, of course, uses like the lib varnish library and so on and so forth. So that's actually a problem for the Debian package because the Debian folks wanted to have everything in, in as few packages as possible. Therefore, the, the first iteration of the package had like a hundred or so dependencies. So it, it depended on, let's say, our dtool. And our dtool at the time depended on uh, libart or something, which depended on GNOME, which depended on X. So you, you wanted to install this small daemon and all of a sudden X was configured. Um, so what they did in order to keep the number of packages small is they, they removed all the dependencies and put them into recommendations with the rationale that they're, they're installed by default. So if you do not install recommended packages by default, essentially it breaks. Mm. And the, the result will be that the load plugin RD tool line <coughs> will result in the error that uh, I cannot find the, the required shared objects, sorry. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm guessing we have time for questions afterwards. All right, next up, aggregation of metrics. So why would you want to do aggregation in the first place? Every once in a while, an aggregated metric conveys more information than a single metric in itself. Uh, example, assume you have a web app, and this web app is running on 100 servers in N plus two data centers. I do not care if one of these uh, instances is down, especially in a cloud environment where they will be rescheduled automatically somewhere else. I have absolutely no interest in, oh my God, this one task is not running. It doesn't interest me at all. Say the data center is completely down. Well, might be an interesting fun fact, but it's nothing to page people about. If, however, your redundancy is gone, you're like two data centers down, well, that is probably something where you want to get kind of itchy about. And um, by the time that, say, the rate of uh, HTTP 500 errors that is sent to the clients exceeds some threshold, well, you really want something to look now. Or say, uh, the latency, the average latency or something exceeds some acceptable threshold, like, say, 20 milliseconds, you want to tell somebody. All of this is not a single metric, a single latency, like this one request took a second. Well, that's too bad, but there's nothing I'm going to do about this. If all the requests are slow, well, I better take a look. Another option, kind of tongue in cheek maybe, um, is Metric storage is usually an I.O. bound problem. You have many small data points and writing them all, all the time uh, often results in a lot of disk seeks. Uh, you can reduce the amount of data written uh, with aggregation, uh, but it's, it's probably a, a bad motivation to have for, for aggregation. Uh, if, if that's your problem, you probably want to look into some uh, distributed storage. Um, Last but not least, um, pre-computed metrics for dashboards are a thing. Like if, if, if your dashboard shows too much information, you're not going to see what you're interested in. 
So the way I usually approach this is that I have a, a global dashboard and from there I can drill down into like a per data center view and from there I can drill down into like a per server view. And uh, that way problems like the, the rate of 500 errors is increasing is, is much easier to spot. So diagram, uh, they say it says more than a thousand words. So this uh, is, is the call ID daemon and it has a couple of input plugins here to the left, uh, whatever that is, absolutely irrelevant. Um, on the right, we have an output plugin for uh, sake of presentation, this is Graphite. And the aggregation plugin that Colleague D has sits on both ends. So it reads metrics from the one side, aggregates them, and then basically injects these newly created metrics these aggregated metrics again into the uh, daemon. Um, it's important to note that it creates new metrics. That means the, the original metrics are not gone. They, they're still there. If you're not interested in the unaggregated metrics and the raw information, you have to filter this out manually. Like there, there's, there's ways to do this. Unfortunately, this presentation does not have time to dive into this in too much detail, but if you're not interested in the raw metrics, you have to filter them out yourself. The aggregation uh, plugin creates new metrics, and last but not least, aggregated metrics, like the metrics coming out of this, they cannot go into the aggregation plugin again. So you cannot have aggregations of ag aggregations that would basically result in a codec system, at least the way it's implemented right now. So here's uh, what you have to do to get this uh, going. First, you have to load the aggregation plugin. That's trivial, I hope. Um, you have to select the metrics that you want, because at this point, just when the plugin is loaded, it, at first it drinks from the firehose, right? It, it gets like all the metrics. And you have to tell it that you're only interested in, let's say, the CPU metrics. Then you have to group the metrics by something, or don't have to, but most people would want to do this. Like CPU example, you would want to group uh, by the CPU state. Let's say all the idle uh, counters or idle rates go into this bucket and all the system uh, rates go into this bucket. Uh, and the example will be uh, IO weight in this uh, presentation. And then you have to actually aggregate by some function. You have to specify that you're interested in the sum or the number of such metrics, or the minimum, or the maximum. Um, and we have average and standard deviation for, well, it was easy to implement. Um, for the future, I think I would like to have a median in some percentile, but doesn't exist right now. This aggregation uh, plugin can be loaded and used both on the client and on the server side. So for instance, you can aggregate over all your CPUs on the client and only send the aggregate to the server and the server only sees the aggregate and doesn't have to care at all about the, the individual metrics anymore. You can't do that, you don't have to. <coughs> so on the left, you see the, the load plugin line for the aggregation plugin and the scaffolding that's going to be required. Uh, you have a, a configuration block, block for the, the plugin, plugin aggregation over here. And then for every aggregation that you want to have, uh, you can actually kind of picture this like an SQL query if you like. Uh, you will have to have one of these aggregation blocks. Like here's uh, the opening aggregation and here's the closing aggregation. On the right, this is for now the metrics that are coming into the plugin. So this is a hot, hot patch of everything. Uh, there's some, I don't know, laptop battery percent charge. There's some CPU metrics on there. There's some disk space available and, and reserved and used and whatnot. And that's everything that comes in. So at first, we have to select what we're interested in. We have five fields usable, uh, whereas the, the type field. So maybe I should diverge uh, shortly into the naming schema used by colleague D. We're going to use this. Um, 
each metric has a name uh, that consists of five parts in CollectD. It's a host name. It's a plugin, which is usually set to the plugin that collects a metric. It is a type, and the type gives CollectD an information about how do I deal with this? What's this? Is it a counter that's increasing? Is it an absolute value? And um, it also gives graphing front ends later on an idea of how to graph this. Like, is this in bytes or bits or Celsius or whatever? And um, grouping by the type is, is mandatory. Uh, sorry, not grouping. Selecting by the type is mandatory. You can only have one type per aggregation. Uh, this for one is because only that makes any any amount of sense because you can't really add your CPU rates to the data center's uh, temperature. Yeah, well, you, you could probably, but you wouldn't really sanely want to do this. Um, and also, it, it just makes the uh, plugin much more performant. Uh, this is uh, exploited in the lookup structure. And then you have uh, the plugin instance, which in, in case of the uh, DF plugin would be the mount point, or uh, if configured so, uh, would be the device. Uh, for CPU, the CPU plugin would be the, the CPU number or the core number. And the type instance is, is used for this one instance of my plugin or this one device that the plugin is, is currently uh, reporting on has multiple uh, metrics of the same type, like the CPU plugin has a counter for idle, and a counter for system, and a counter for user, and a counter for steel, or whatnot. Well, the memory plugin has uh, free and used memory, and then on Linux, cached and buffered, or on BSDs, active and wired, and it, it's all memory, it's all like blocks of bytes. The um, the four non-mandatory uh, parts of the name that you can use to select, like host through plugin instance and then type instance, there you can use regular expressions if you want to. But uh, for the most part, I guess it's uh, just a, a static string that people match. Uh, the type has to, to be like a one specific type. You can't use a regex there. So here, we add plugin must equal CPU and type must also equal CPU to filter out only the CPU uh, metrics that were collected by the CPU plugin. And on the right again, you see now the, the filtered view of the metrics. Um, now only the CPU metrics are left, and this is the entire data set that the aggregation will now work on. So here, where, where it says plugin CPU, if you would have a slash at the beginning and at the end, you could fill in a regex here and do some more fancy stuff like, I know, the, as I said, the, the uh, core ID is stored in the plugin instance and with a uh, regex such as um, 02468 dollar or something, you could select only the, the even numbered uh, CPU IDs, for instance something that might make sense if you have hyperthreading enabled. Might, but not necessarily. The second step, once you have all these, uh, these metrics selected that are interesting and should go into, into the aggregation, uh, you can, but not necessarily have to, uh, specify grouping. In our example, we are going to specify grouping by the type instance, which the type instance holds uh, the, the CPU state, uh, system, idle, user, a nice, and so forth. Um, because we don't want to add idle and system and wait, we want to ha keep them separate. But we don't want to like select by every single one, we just want to say that every CPU state that you have, uh, merge all of them, aggregate all of them together into one metric. You have to leave one field unspecified. Like one, one part of the name needs to remain open. If you select by it and you group by it, there's nothing left to aggregate on. Then you have a uniquely identified metric and that's not something that you can aggregate. So you have to leave some part of the, of the name open and unspecified. So here we, we fill in the group by host. We wanna have a per host 
view of the world, and we also group by the type instance. So the type instance, as I said, holds uh, idle user weight and so on. Uh, it actually has eight metrics on Linux. I only had these three on the previous slide, so I only copied these here. Um, what's missing now is the, the plugin instance. We didn't specify the plugin instance. So the, all the plugin instances, all the CPU IDs, are now merged into one. So we don't, we don't have any information for what goes into this field. What is stored in this field, in the, so, so normally it would now just say empty. In case of the plugin instance, that field is actually used to store the aggregation function used. So the aggregation function functions available, as I mentioned, are count, which is number of metrics that went into this, this aggregation. If, if you had, I don't know, a host with 16 CPUs, you would now have, well, we had 16 idle states and 16 user states and 16 whatever. Not very useful, but that's how it, what would happen. Uh, you could use this, for instance, uh, for, say, calculate the count of uh, requests served metrics, and by that way, you get the number of uh, instances uh, that your web app is running in right now. And if that drops below, I don't know, some magic number, then something is amiss. Uh, you can sum the metrics. Now, that actually sums the, the values of the metrics. Doesn't only count them, but, but sums the, the values. Minimum, maximum do what you would expect them to do. Uh, minimum, maximum uh, number of the metrics. And uh, last but not least, uh, average and standard deviation. Uh, I, I have yet to hear someone finding standard deviation useful, but it's there. So once you, you uh, enable the uh, sum uh, aggregation function here, uh, this is filled in here. So you could select more, you could select the average, for instance, here, and then you would get another set of three metrics. Um, and now you have a sum of, of the CPU weight metric, uh, which gives you an idea of how much time the server, the entire server, not just one CPU, uh, spends waiting on some form of I.O. And we're going to exploit this next. So uh, to reiterate, uh, it's, create, it's creating additional metrics. You have to filter out the raw metrics if, you, if you're not interested. You can do this on the client or the server. You can also do this on the client and the server, if that's any, any use. Um, yeah, that's everything I have for the aggregation part. Do you want to ask any questions for the aggregation part now? Hi, I do collect data matrix uh, with Cacti now, mm -hmm. and there is a problem, not a big deal, but a, a problem. When I collect the CPU matrix, for example, uh, it doesn't add to 100% because of a slight time ship when aggregating the, the, the data. Uh, are the aggregations in Collect D uh, better uh, a slighter time? Is is that managed? You know what I mean? Yes, I do. I, I think I do. Um, so right now, this will change with the next version. But right now, Collect D is reporting chiffies, and chiffies do not necessarily sum up to 100, which is unfortunate. But uh, uh, due to Linux kernel internals and the way that their scheduler works these days. It used to be different. These days, doesn't sum up to 100 anymore. Um, the next version of Colleague D will have an option that you can report a percentage. And then it will always sum up to 100. Um, the percentage is uh, calculated after reading all the metrics in. So we can, not regarding uh, the floating point uh, arithmetic uh, errors that necessarily get introduced at some point. But apart from this, we can guarantee that it will sum up to 100 
I don't know, plus minus something to the power of negative 15 or something. Um, so the next version will have something that hopefully solves this problem once and all, for all and for good. And it can all also uh, sum up <coughs> stuff, like sum up all the CPUs and everything I showed you with the aggregation plugin, the CPU plugin will have built in in the future because it was such a highly requested feature. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes. it, uh, it would be, uh, if it could be possible to, to group aggregations uh, to a, a slider time slice, uh, that would be an uh, option. So the in the moment, I have aggregations of the CPUs, mm -hmm. and they could be long, uh, in a long time, happened uh, to different CPUs. And so when I sum them, they don't reach their 100% or over 100%. But when I could group them to a slider time slice, to, to, to collect them at one time, that would be better. You know what I mean? I'm not, in t so uh, w what I get is that you could uh, sidetrack this problem or you could, could avoid this problem by, by calculating the aggregations uh, more frequently. Uh, not more frequently, but in a, I collect them every five minutes. Mm -hmm. And with the start of, of the collection, the first CPU can be in the beginning and the last CPU in the end of the collection summary. Okay, so um, is Kaki still using SNMP as a collection method? Yes. Uh, SNMP is a stateless protocol, so essentially it reads one metric and then it like it's one round trip and then it reads the second metric and then the third and if you have 16 cpus with eight states each you have your 128 or something um uh round trips and of course by the time that you read the last metric from from the server uh it's not necessarily in sync with the first uh on linux colleague d reads uh the the cpu information from slash proc and it's open opens the file once uh I'm not a kernel expert, but I believe that the kernel is essentially storing the state. So by the, the file contents, it, it's not a real file, but the file contents does not change while you're reading it. So it, it's read in, in one go, and it will get values that are consistent with each other. Um, also, you don't have any network round trips, and it's written in C, and it's reading a file, and the little uh, integer processing that it does is fast enough. So I would argue that by the time that Kakti finished reading the first two or three metrics, the colleague D code is totally done with the CPU stuff. Okay, thank you. Uh, caveat, I have not performed any timing on this. Uh, just a guess offhand. Right, then let's uh, go to the last part, which is uh, using Colleg D and the data collected by Colleg D and uh, Isinga to do some alerting. Um, to do this alerting, you will need a Colleg D plugin, which is called Unix SOC. Uh, it does what you would expect, I guess, uh, which is open a Unix domain socket and this is your API or like a management style API into Colleg D, and then you can use that Unix domain socket to query all sorts of information from Colleg D. Uh, most interesting for our part will be the so-called getVal or getValue command, which can be used to read the last known uh, value of a metric. The second part that we need is a small binary called Colleg D dash Natias for historic reasons, it's been around for a while. Um, th what this binary does is it connects to this Unix domain socket, it issues this getVal request, and it re reads out the, the value, the last known value of the metric. And then 
with the thresholds that you specify in the command line, it will check if the value is in the range or outside e-range, and then exit with your typical uh, warning or critical status. Both of these parts are part of the core colleague D distribution, so if you have colleague D installed, you should already have everything that you need. This is one of the plugins that, that does not require any dependencies. So it's just EC program doing a Unix domain socket uh, runs on virtually any Unix, I hope. This is how you would configure this plugin. You, you load it again, which is, well, not that surprising, even though it's uh, not, necess not absolutely necessary in the, the latest version of Colleague D. Uh, you can instruct Colleague D to load, automatically load any plugins for which it has a uh, configuration block. Um, and then you configure the file, like uh, Unix domain sockets are just files, socket files in the file system. So uh, I think this is the default value, but don't count on it. Um, so var run colleague d-unix sock is the file that it will create and uh, that can then be used. Access control to these sort of sockets is uh, done the same way that you do uh, access controls on files. So you have to specify uh, a mod, like permissions for the, for the f file, uh, which is uh, 660 here. So the, the user, which is presumably colleague D or something like this, itself can read and write to the socket. And then you usually have some sort of group which is also allowed to read and write. You have to be right to actually communicate, so it's, it's not like overriding. Uh, the socket group is set here as colleague D, not yours. Uh, the, the file is automatically changed group to this group, so the colleague D process needs to have permission to do this and most likely needs to be in that group itself to be allowed to do this. Uh, delete socket is a uh, bit cosmetic for these files are not automatically uh, cleaned up when the, the process who opened them goes away. So if a server crashes, for instance, and you reboot the machine, the file lingers and the file is still there. You can't really use it and you can't really talk to anybody over the file or the Unix domain socket. So this option, this delete socket true down here tells colleague D that if it starts and if it finds a file there, don't just reuse it, or which is not possible, uh, but delete it, create a new one, and then everything's fine. This is just a, a piece of, of cleanup infrastructure. You could do this in a, in a in a script, I guess. This is how the communication with the Unix socket looks like. It is very easy and straightforward. Uh, get well, and then you give it this uh, string, which is hopefully exactly I think I, I'm using average here, and I used some before, but it, essentially it is what we had in the aggregation slides. And it returns a string. Uh, so if, if this string starts with a numerical value greater than zero, or, or zero or greater than zero, it's success. If it has anything negative, then it's a, an error. And in this case, it, it tells uh, the client that one value found, meaning the, the one here is not just readable, but uh, it also tells the client to read one more line, which is this one, and it tells the client that the value currently is something around eight and a half. So this is how to get at the, the metric, at the value, uh, in this case an aggregated value, but you would get at any other metric in the very same way. Then you can use uh, the colleague D, not just uh, binary, which is a Unix socket client, talks to colleague D via this Unix socket, and then applies the, the thresholds that you specify and, and exits and prints accordingly. So this is how you would run this. It's, again, I guess fairly straightforward. You have to specify the, the file, the, the socket that it should connect to. Um, the, the name is split up in two parts here because this appears to be Nagia slash Isinga best practices that you have a dash capital H uh, argument. So we do two uh, dash capital H example com and and then the rest of the, the metric that you're interested in internally this just gets concatenated together. And then the uh, uh, dash W and dash C arguments uh, again I think we're implementing all of the 
uh, recommended or usual uh, syntax. So you can have Cullen number and number Cullen and number Cullen number and trust number and weird. And it, I think I got a tilde at the beginning is like a negation. I don't know. All sorts of crap. Yes, please. I can repeat the question too. Yes, Th this. Is that right. If you want to check this remotely, you will basically have to get to the machine somehow and then talk to it. There, there's some code out there, uh, which it's yet to be finalized. It's only like a couple of years old, uh, which would allow you to do the same thing via a, a network socket. But we haven't figured out the author, uh, authentication and authorization story yet. So that's where this is currently missing. We don't want to provide a, a management socket that is utterly unprotected. That's, that will just harm users more than it will help them, I, I'm afraid. So yes, um, we, are, we are still working on something that would make this possible via the network. But right now, it's a Unix domain socket. And you have to run the colleague D, not just binary locally on, on whatever machine colleague D is running on. And the uh, the output is um, very generic. It's a very generic tool, unfortunately. Um, it can, in, in some limited ways, check more than one value. So it will tell you that all the values that it checked were OK, which is one value. Uh, and it will print the, the performance data, I think it's called, uh, at the end. So you can, kind of weird, I guess, but you can, again, track this performance data via Isinga somehow. Um, caveat, I am absolutely not an Isinga expert. So everything here, I essentially uh, copied from the documentation. So please excuse any uh, errors, even if they're obvious to people who know Isinga. But this is roughly how it should work. Uh, so you define a command, which in this case, I, I call check CPU IO colleague D. And it calls the colleague D not just command line binary with the host name, which is a parameter. And then the uh, dash W and dash C arguments are uh, placeholders. And in some service uh, definition, uh, you would have the host name, which is then filled in over here. And in, in this uh, unfortunate uh, exclamation mark syntax, uh, you would provide the thresholds that you want to check against. And ideally, this would then alert if uh, if your CPU, isn't this the wrong way around? It should alert if uh, this, the host is spending too much time waiting on, on I.O. That's the idea anyway. Uh, so this, this example is by no means complete. So uh, sorry. Uh, you still need like uh, host groups and hosts and whatnot. So. What's next on the roadmap? Um, I've heard through the gra grapevine, and this might very well be wrong, that Isinga 2 will provide a new, better way to provide passive checks. That would allow colleague D to basically do the checking as it gets the, the metric and provide checks in more or less real time. And since colleague D is collecting metrics per default at a 10 second interval, you could also in theory, do the checks in 10 second intervals. Uh, I'm not so sure you actually want to re react to something that quickly, but you could if you, if you would like to. Um, so yes, if anybody uh, thinks that would be an, an interesting thing to work on, I'm more than welcome to review patches. That is all I have. Uh, I think we still have time for, for Q&A. So uh, if I left anything open or you have additional recommendations or anything, now's your time. Questions? Yeah. Um, when using the Nagios plugin, uh, do you have any possibility to check how old the value is that you're getting? 
because um, you assumed, you said if the whole um, half of the data center is down, how do you see that the value you're asking is old? I thought the time was included in this reply, but apparently okay, it's not. I, yes, you in, you should be able to to get via the Unix domain socket at the age of of the metric. Uh, this is not currently regarded by the Collegi Natchez uh, binary, so that binary will just ignore the time. Um, but it would, in theory, be possible without too much work to to implement this, and to I don't know implement a timeout uh, option or something like this. So I should work on a patch. Yes, please. <laughs> I guess you cannot ask for averages over time? Not currently, no. Okay. Um, but if if I get around to implement something like a percentile aggregation or a median uh, aggregation, we will have to uh, store multiple raw values over time anyway, and then we should also be able to do something like an average over time. But right now, that's not possible. It's possible to query more than one metric at the time with one request? I would have to look that up. I don't think so. Sorry? I, I would have to look this up, but I don't think that it's possible. But I, I, I can look it up after the talk and give you a definite answer. Any more questions? Um, so since yesterday we know that there are multiple ways to roam. Um, so what would be best practice or um, the advantage of using Collect-E um, storing the matrix for memory, CPU, and then using the uh, Collecti Nagios plugin or even check graphite. Chris mentioned uh, over the solution using Isinga for collecting the matrix and storing them in graphite and doing the notification based on what Isinga sees. So, what's the major advantage for you using Collecti and this uh, chain? So, I, I think that. Using Collect D for metrics collection is a more lightweight uh, approach, allowing you to collect a wider ver variety of, of metrics. There's a, a huge number of metrics that you can collect that you would not necessarily want to use for alerting. So, I guess there there means uh, to uh, pipe values through Isinga without basing any alerting on top of these values. But it would feel to me that this would be like a, an extra step that's not necessar necessary. Um, but yes, it, it's a valid approach, I, I think, if, if you have the checks and, and that's all you need. Um, but I'm pretty certain that there are Collect-D input plugins uh, that do not have uh, a Nagios or a Singa counterpart. And even if they have a, a check counterpart, the checks usually focus on is it OK or not, yes, no. And then performance data comes with this, maybe a little. And uh, colleague D's focus clearly is on performance data. And it will get stuff from Varnish that you didn't know existed. And it will read in ODB uh, information that is no use to me at all, because I don't know MySQL well enough. But some MySQL expert out there was very adamant that he wanted to have exactly this. So yeah, I, I think. <coughs> the um, the advantage is that you have more metrics that you need for alerting, which you can have because it's quite performant. And basing your alerting on this allows you to have like a, a dashboard with accompanying information to to your outage. Okay, thanks. Sure. <coughs> 
um, when I do the checks with Nagios or Itzinger, I do it every five minutes. Is it possible with the Nagios Collective plugin uh, to <coughs> ask if in the last five minutes were uh, some 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 peak done uh, or something? Uh, collect the data of the last uh, last five minutes and look if there were a maximum. So, <coughs> Colleague D has uh, the code in place to internally keep a bit of history. Um, I'm not entirely certain if this history is exposed by the Unixoc plugin, and what it could fairly easily be, be made to expose this if it's not existing already. Um, but the colleague D not just binary for certain does not take advantage of this. But it, it, it's again a project that would be not too hard to implement. Thank you. Sure. And thank you for the presentation. Thank you. <laughs>